All right, well, so let's see if we can actually deliver on that uh, promise. Um, so today we want to talk about consistency or the lack thereof. And well, as Christian was mentioning, we are a set of academic researchers. Um, so Sebastian now postdoc at uh, Vienna. Uh, I am a faculty at SUSPA, have been for a couple of years. And you kind of took away this one pun that I had, right? Because we look very professional in these pictures. And then there's this less professional picture, which is about two weeks old. Um, as you can see, Sebastian was more hugging than I was planning to, but that's fine by me. <laughs> now, because this is the talk after lunch, and everybody's like, oh no, food coma, I want to go to sleep, we actually will do some interactive stuff here, okay? So this talk requires interaction. As we saw earlier, when uh, being asked for your favorite animals and so on, there are no wrong answers. Actually, there are a lot of wrong answers, um, but that's perfectly fine. We can, handle, we can handle those. So let me try and, well, do this exercise with you. I have the following question. Listen carefully. We talk about web security. What, and maybe the first one who has an answer can just yell it at me, what is the web's primary purpose that starts with the letter P? <laughs> Nobody? OK, so the obvious answer is puppy pictures, right? <laughs> now, we would like to consume our favorite puppy pictures in a secure way. However, on the web, there are loads of different types of attackers that, well, threaten these cute little animals here. And so we can have attackers that try to exploit click-checking vulnerabilities, um, that exploit cross-site scripting, that go and attack applications that are prone to cross site request forgery attacks. And we can even have network attackers who eavesdrop on, on the traffic, even in the super fast network that is called Eduroam here. Now, the web has existed for, for many years, and these attacks have been known for many years, which is why modern browsers actually implement a ton of countermeasures against these types of things, or at least to mitigate these types of things. And these range from things like uh, XFO, so X-frame options, for framing control, CSP, content security policy, to mitigate cross-site scripting and a couple other things. HSTS to always enforce HTTPS connections such that a network attacker will not be able to eavesdrop on our traffic. Um, and we can even configure cookies, which we use for authentication on the web, to well, no longer be prone to these types of attacks as, as CSERF. Now, if we think about our puppy picture website, we would like to have consistent protection on the one inside, irrespective of what browser is coming, whether I'm on my mobile phone or on my laptop or use Windows for some reason, I don't know. Um, and we also want this to be consistent across the entirety of all the puppy pictures that are on this puppy picture website, right? We don't want some subpages to not have that particular protection. And this is what we understand with consistency that is irrespective of the client characteristics or the URL that we're visiting, we should get the same level of protection. Now, as you said earlier, uh, we are a set of, of academics, um, so such a talk must contain such science much wow. Uh, today, we'll actually be talking about primarily two papers. Um, Sebastian will be talking about the security lottery paper from last year's USNIC security, where we looked at measuring security inconsistencies in deployed um, security headers. And then I will take over towards the end to talk about our proposal, which is called site policy, and how that can, if ever adopted, uh, maybe mitigate some of the issues that we will be discussing in the next couple of minutes with you. Now, before we can do this, um, I remember, Christian, you once introduced me as the old lady of cross-site scripting. Um, so thank you for that. But let me give you a quick recap on cross-site scripting, given that particular qualification that I seem to be having. Now, cross-site scripting is an attack where an adversary finds a vulnerability, in this case, a reflected server-side cross-site scripting vulnerability, which means that this PL parameter here is somehow reflected back in the HTTP response. Now, the attacker sends this to our poor victim, who now visits this website, valen.com, and by doing so, gets back in the HTTP response a script that points to evil.com. Now, a browser doesn't really understand, is this something that is intended to be there? Is it something injected by an attacker? It just sees, oh, there's a script tag with the URL, so it does what it's supposed to do. It will download the resource, and execute the JavaScript, right? In this case, it could, for example, be stealing passwords, exfiltrating cookies, whatever you can imagine. Now, to 
mitigate cross-site scripting, we can use a so-called content security policy, or CSP for short. And CSP essentially is a mechanism that allows the developer of an application to say, well, these are the allowed scripts that can be executed. So the developer can say, I only want scripts to be coming from my own website, or uh, that are nonced, we'll see that in a second. And this way, the XSS flaw doesn't go away, right? The reflection still happens, and we still get the script source back. But because the browser sees the CSP, it says, nope, I'm not going to download anything from evil.com here. And CSP, in particular, script source, um, and for those people that have attended last year's presentation from Sebastian and myself, we talked a lot about the complexity of CSP and how all of this kind of uh, breaks in practice. But just for XSS mitigation with the script source property, or directive, sorry. And this can have a couple of different entries. So, for example, the keyword self means scripts can come from my own origin. So if I'm example.com, then any script from example.com is allowed to be executed. I can specify some other sites, right? Advertisement.com, we all know that the web is primarily kind of fueled by, by ads. And we can also have nonces. And the idea of nonces is that we would like to have inline JavaScript, right? So script tag, some code inside the closing script tag. But how could we differentiate between this is intended by the developer versus this was in injected by the attacker? And the idea of a nonce is that in the HTTP response, and CSP is an HTTP response header, we generate this random value, we put this into the CSP, and then we attach this random value to every single script that we as the developer wanted to have in our website, right? Under the assumption that this is random, an attacker cannot guess it. So they can still inject a script, but they can't guess the random nonce. So we're winning as, as the defender here. And it's very, really important that this is supposed to be random. And the name nonce stands for number used once, right? We might get to that later on. And the final piece of the puzzle is that we can also allow scripts through their hash, right? Um, so we compute the hash of an inline script, for example, and then add it to the policy. And this is a policy that we can consider more or less secure uh, in most cases. And this will allow us to at least mitigate cross-site scripting. Now, at this point, uh, I'd like to hand over to, to Sebastian. And there was a question about uh, favorite animals earlier, right? You can see that I'm a dog person, so I'll now hand over to our cat person here. Yeah, as Ben mentioned, uh, I'm more a cat person rather than a dog uh, person. However, uh, also looking for cat pictures in the internet uh, can be dangerous um, because, for example, if we are on an untrusted cat pictures website and click on buttons that are offering us even more cat pictures, it can be dangerous. Because, for example, an attacker can uh, overlay the yes button with a transparent iframe that is, in this case, showing an instant buy button. And we would suddenly buy weird stuff on Amazon. Um, but also against this kind of attack, there are security headers. As mentioned in the beginning, we have XRAM options. And this header can have the, can be set to deny, such that no one can frame the page. It uh, can be set to same origin, such that I can only load myself or my website in itself. And it also has the allow from uh, mode, where you can allow a specific partner website, but only one specific partner website, which is a problem. And also allow from is not supported nowadays by modern browsers. Uh, in general, XFO is deprecated since a while now, which is why we should actually use another solution here. And it's CSP again, because besides mitigating cross-head scripting, it has also the capability with the Fremen sisters directive to uh, protect uh, the website from getting loaded in an iframe from other pages. And because we have CSP syntax here, we can actually have multiple partner websites. Another important thing on the web is transport encryption. Uh, and I think we all agree that HTTPS is important, but it should also be enforced. And what you can use to enforce that your website is only loaded via HTTPS 
is the strict transport security header. And uh, one thing that you need to specify here is the max age. So for how long is the browser now forced in only loading the website via HTTPS? Another thing that you can specify is that this protection also applies to all subdomains of the current domain. And what you can also specify is that it is preloaded. That is important because if you think about it, it's a response header. Uh, so it is only active after the first visit. So the first visit would not be protected, which is where uh, you can use the preload keyword and ask for putting your domain in the list of preloaded HSTS uh, domains, which are embedded in every browser. So also, also the first connection is secured by the header. Uh, however, this is only for the connection itself, not for all assets loaded by the website. And here we have another mechanism. And as you might have guessed, it's CSP again. Because besides doing cross-site scripting, mitigation, and framing control, we can also enforce that all assets are loaded via encrypted connections with the upgrade insecure requests directive. Another quite popular thing nowadays in websites is cookies. And also, those can have security attributes. And as you can see here, we have a key value pair that is stored, which is a session ID in this case. Um, and to protect it, for example, from an XSS attacker, we can use HTTP only, such that it is not accessible by JavaScript anymore. We can also protect from network-based attacks by enforcing that this cookie is only sent via encrypted connections, so it is harder for a network attacker to actually get hands on the session ID here. And what we can also do is specifying to in, in which kind of contexts uh, this cookie is sent. For example, uh, with same site set to strict, this cookie is only sent via same site top level navigation requests. If it is set to lax, it is only sent via same site requests. And if it is set to none, it is sent to all, uh, only on secure connections, because actually setting it to none requires the cookie to be marked as a secure cookie. So none is disabling same site, but still uh, requiring secure cookies. Uh, yeah, and as Ben mentioned, we have a lot of interaction here. So it's quiz time. <laughs> and now that you've learned a lot of, about the headers, uh, what would you say uh, if those two headers, uh, separated by a, a commata, are deployed on a website? Which is the one that is actually active? Which rules do apply? Any idea? Yeah, I heard first one. And that is indeed the case, because according to the standard, uh, only the first one is considered, and everything else, even if it is more secure and uh, has more, offers more protection, uh, is ignored. Then for cookies, if we would set uh, two uh, session IDs here, uh, which, is, which of the cookies uh, is actually set. So will it be secure or will it not be secure? Yes, in case of cookies, they decided that, to, uh, that the last one is the one that should be chosen. And then what happens for XFO if we suddenly fold our header or if we have multiple XFRAM options headers? Yeah. I, <laughs> middle, middle is kind of right. Uh, it depends on the browser, but uh, so when the designing XRAM options, they had not uh, in, in their mind that headers could be folded together and separated with a commata. Therefore, the standard says this is neither deny nor same origin nor allow from because it is the string same origin commata deny and therefore not valid and is ignored. <laughs> Uh, then we have the content security policy. Uh, and 
what would you say would happen if we are deploying this value? Uh, no, because here it is actually specified in the standard. Um, because we are not sending multiple headers here, but two times the same directive. And then the CSP standard says that only the first one is valid. So the second part is ignored. If we would, however, instead of a semicolon, use a commenter here, then both would be enforced. So uh, we are only allowing all inline scripts that carry a nonce. So we would basically disallow external scripts with a nonce. <laughs> um, yeah, as you can see, uh, multiple headers with multiple defined or not defined behaviors. So crazy stuff is going on here, um, which is why at some point uh, a lottery takes place if uh, not everything is properly configured. But what is a security inconsistency or the security inconsistency that we investigated here? So if we get a response with similar content, so the same cute cat picture in this case, uh, but we uh, get different security headers, we have inconsistencies. If we, however, get a totally different content, and there is a difference, we are not comparing those uh, such that we are not reporting wrong numbers here. And as Ben said, we have made uh, such science much wow, and actually have a methodology of how we investigated uh, some numbers here, and we defined several tests, such as different user agents, VPN and Tor and nodes, and different language settings that we tested. Then we visited the top 10,000 websites and executed each test five times. Uh, with each time with a fresh context, so a fresh browsing session. And based on the gathered data, we, did, uh, we uh, are now distinguishing two different kind of inconsistencies. First, we have the intra-test inconsistency. If those five requests are already inconsistent, for example, if we had three times a proper security header and two times not for, the, for a site loaded via the Tor US End node. And on the other hand, we have uh, the intertest inconsistencies. If, for example, we had a site that was deploying security for one user agent but was not deploying it for another user agent. So, uh, as I said, science, much numbers and such, but the important thing here is that for each of the mechanisms uh, that we investigated, we found. Uh, and each of the factors that we checked, or each of the tests, we found quite a number of inconsistencies in the wild. And we also then ask ourselves, how the hell did that happen? Well, one common theme for user agent inconsistencies was that they are on the server side using some user agent parsing to have user agent traps to treat some user agent differently. Uh, here we have seen that, for example, we, uh, some sites only deployed XRAM options for desktop browsers, but not for the mobile versions of exactly the same web application. Uh, we have seen that, for example, a Saint CSP was only uh, given out to non-Apple users, so all iOS browsers and, all, and Safari uh, did not get a proper CSP. Uh, we also had discrimination of specific browsers. So, for example, Firefox uh, not getting any frame ancestors directive on in CSP. And, of course, this whole behavior does not make sense, but more on this later. Because one interesting case in terms of user agent parsing was Firefox on iOS. Because we had extremely many websites, more than 130, that actually uh, gave secure cookies to every browser except Firefox on iOS. And we asked us, what the hell is going on there? Firefox actually has a different uh, version number on iOS, because on iOS, all browsers are Safari with uh, different skin. And therefore, Mozilla decided this is not a real Firefox, so we are giving out a different version number here. 
and the user agent passed it and thought, yeah, it's version two or three of Firefox. They are not supporting secure cookies, so we are not giving them secure cookies. Um, as said, this is kind of stupid behavior because uh, browser traps uh, for specific browser do not make sense. On the one hand, we uh, users actually might change their user agent because of privacy concerns, such that they are less identifiable, especially if they are using a non-widely used browser. Then uh, developers at some point unnecessarily need to maintain uh, those browser traps again, because, for example, last year, uh, Safari decided to finally support strict dynamic in CSP. So if you had a browser trap specific for that case, you need to now remove it again. And actually having it does not make sense from the beginning because all headers are backwards compatible. So for example, in case of CSP, if there is an unknown source expression or even an unknown directive, uh, only this expression or this directive is ignored and the rest of the policy is still active and is still securing the website. So that explains how it has happened for user agents, but how did it happen for uh, geolocations? So um, from the caching headers and, and IP addresses that we have seen when crawling uh, the web, uh, we, we, we uh, had, for example, uh, some sites that are deploying framing control for uh, some countries like Russia, Spain, or Sweden, but they not deploy it for other countries, for example, the US, which was because they have different origin servers and only configured one correctly and the other one not. Um, yeah, so much on the deterministic intertest inconsistencies, but as mentioned in the beginning, we also have intratest inconsistencies. And because they are seemingly random, because in some, uh, without changing anything on our side, we get different responses in the five te uh, tests. Therefore, we are not attributing those changes to the factor that we tested, but rather have some numbers here for the different mechanisms that we checked. Uh, but overall, the important message here is uh, if you are having those seemingly random responses, an opportunistic attacker can, well, just continue trying the attack until he succeeds and matches one of the cases where the header is suddenly not secure anymore. But also those inconsistencies can be complicated. And if we, for example, have an inconsistency where the HSTS header is not present in some of the tests, or if it is changed in some of the tests, what would be your wild guess? Uh, which one is the worst, more worse inconsistency here? What? <laughs> ah, uh, yeah. Um, the point is. R raise usually, your hand if you think it's the left hand side. The worst inconsistency. <laughs> okay. Left hand side is worse? Okay, right hand side is worse? Okay. Both are equally bad. <laughs> <laughs> then I actually not. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, in this case, uh, it's actually bad to have uh, to only uh, inconsistently deploy the preload uh, keyword because you cannot only enter your website into the preload list, you can also remove it. And to remove it, uh, we need to deploy the HSTS, a still valid HSTS header without the preload keyword. So what we can do now as an attacker is Query those, uh, this removal website until their crawler hits one of the cases where preload is not present. So we can actually remove websites from the preload list without the developer even noticing that this has happened. But how does those random inconsistencies happen? One thing that we have seen is that it might be due to load balancing. When you have a load balancer that is distributing the loads on several origin servers, and one of them is misconfigured, and therefore not deploying the security header. Uh, another thing that we have seen uh, is caching practices, because for some reason, sometimes we got a relatively new cache with a 
secure version of the header, and at some point we uh, we got a super old cache hit with a uh, very old version of the header. Yeah, so to sum up what have we have seen in the last couple of minutes, there are a lot of client-side uh, security headers, and they are not equally distributed or delivered to all clients. We had 321 sites that had some kind of security inconsistency here, and those were mostly due to misconfigured server for specific countries or browser traps in case of the intertest inconsistencies, or the intratest inconsistencies happened also due to misconfigured servers or uh, weird caching practices, but they play into the hand of opportunistic attackers and they are actually also impacting web measurements. So if you're planning to do a measurement, don't forget the, to load the website multiple times. So we talked a lot about randomness and also Ben mentioned in the beginning that nonces are supposed to contain random data, right? However, some sites might have taken this a little bit too literally. For example, lib6.fr deployed the nonce random mail, random pub, random Twitter, and actually uh, uh, the, the second last one is the most random one because it is twice as random. Uh, as you might have guessed, those are not uh, placeholders. Those are the real nonces deployed by the website. <laughs> then we had cases like the American Heart Association with a lot of seemingly random uh, nonces in their uh, policy. However, those are only seemingly random because if we base64 decode those values, it's actually pretty similar because they have a nonce for, for example, including Google Analytics. But even in cases where we have seen random uh, nonces on most of the requests, like, for example, we had it for parkoursub.fr. Uh, so we got a random nonce every request, sometimes the nonce twice, and thought, what the hell is happening here? So we also base64 decoded this value, and it <laughs> for those that are working with timestamps, uh, see that it is actually a timestamp when the page was loaded. And the timestamp also gives you a hint on how cutting edge this data is, uh, <laughs> because we just created the slides right before this presentation. Uh, when we then Googled a little bit on how the hell people came uh, up with the idea that static nonces are a thing that you should deploy, we also found an interesting feature request on Nux.js, where they actually ask for static nonce such that they don't need to use unsafe inline anymore, such that they can uh, have amplification via a CDN provider. The point is uh, that this opens an interesting problem because for CDNs, they don't only cache the HTML, but they are also caching the response headers. So you have static nonces if you are having the, uh, if you are using caches here. but. For those examples, uh, those is currently under submission, so stay tuned for uh, the next papers of Ben's group. And with that, uh, Ben. <laughs> all right, so thank Go you, Sebastian, until here. Um, all right, so we kind of saw that these, these inconsistencies are a relatively widespread issue. Um, and then it's, it's nice uh, to, to measure these things, right? Um, my group has been very successful in just measuring things, but we thought, let's, let's try and maybe come up with a solution that could work, right? And so, is there some way to solve this problem? Um, and before we can talk about a potential solution, I need to kind of add m more science. Um, we did an, kind of an orthogonal study to what we did with the security lottery, because with security lottery, we looked at the start pages of websites five times. But this is not the only problem that you can have, right? You can also have under the same origin, different content. And so what we did there is we did both a, a vertical and a horizontal scan, um, looked at 15K websites up to 300 subpages. And our expectation here is that we have this, if we have the same object that is, for example, um, 
any document under the same origin, right, that belongs to the same object, or uh, cookies, that these should always have the same level of security. That's the hope. Um, reality is about 9% of the unique cookies that we found have differing security attributes. Um, the biggest traction of them actually uh, having differences in the secure flag, which I still don't understand because we were only visiting HTTPS websites. So I have no idea why somebody would then not set the secure flag. For those people that were here last year, uh, we talked about the fact that deploying a safe CSP is incredibly tough and very few websites even get this right for a single page. And it turns out that of those few sites that got it right on at least a single page, 50% of them just for another page on the same origin did not have a CSP, which invalidates the entire security yet again. And similarly for HSTS, we found that actually 81% of sites um, were, were inconsistent in that respect. And primarily, our findings showed that in particular for CSP and HSTS, the majority of cases why there was inconsistent protection is because one was simply missing the header entirely, which is kind of a weird thing to, to have, right? And so we looked at potential solutions. And there is actually a proposal, well, well there was a proposal um, until 2022 uh, from the W3C, which was called Origin Policy. And here the idea is as follows. You specify a, a manifest file, right, under a .well-known directory. You know this if you've kind of uh, done something with Let's Encrypt, for example. Um, or we also have like robots.txt for control crawlers. So we have a well-specified location where you put this manifest. And then you have an HTTP header to specify which origin policy should be used from that manifest, right? So all browsers would then go download that manifest and then will apply that uniformly across the origin. Not quite, um, because problem number one is origin policy doesn't have a selector. It has a caching identifier. So that means I need to have one policy, origin policy, that I specify that controls all the security mechanisms that needs to be exactly the same for my entire origin, right? Which is a non-trivial thing. And more importantly, in terms of the, the problems that we saw on the previous slide, like why did people not get protection, is because they forgot to add an HTTP header. The problem with origin policy is you need to add the origin policy HTTP header for this to be activated. So if you make that same mistake of for omitting one header, then cool that you have a manifest file, but it's never going to be loaded or enforced. So that's another issue. And the third problem that we identified is that if we think about cookies in HSTS, these don't belong to an origin, right? Cookies can be domain scoped, so that as they belong to that domain and all of its children. For HSTS, we saw what Sebastian was presenting, the include subdomains property, which also controls HSTS for the subdomains. So having something that's bound to an origin doesn't make sense if we actually want to have security mechanisms that go beyond this origin boundary. And so we proposed um, site policy, which effectively takes the, the good part from origin policy, that is a central manifest file. But we fix the problematic parts. We try to. So first, we say there should be site-wide defaults. So that is, if there exists a manifest and there is no explicit site policy header, we assume the site policy header was forgotten by the developer, meaning we should still enforce some default. right? And what the default is is actually then up to the developer. You can see it on the lower right-hand side corner over here. Right? We, have, we specify some, some default policies that the browser will, will, will then fall back to. Second, security exceptions must be made explicit, right? Because if we omit the header, we fall back to the default. So if we want to have an insecure configuration of something, we need to add a, an insecure policy to our manifest and then explicitly select this insecure policy. So now we turn the problem around where if we forgot something, by default, now, nowadays you're insecure and there you would be secure unless you explicitly opt to be insecure. And also, in terms of understanding the attack surface that your application has, is you can just look at the manifest file. It gives you worst case security guarantees, right? Because you can go through all the available policies and say, these are the ones that would be bad in terms of security. So we have kind of a lower bound of, of security. And well, it's nice for us academics to be in our nice little ivory tower. Um, actually, we, we still owe the uh, W3C and the Web App Consortium a discussion about this, um, because I think it, it might actually solve a couple of problems. Now, before we go to 
the current situation where we don't yet have our um, site policy in place. I, I do want to uh, do a quick quiz bonus round. One header that we haven't really talked about um, that is relatively-ish new is called permissions policy. Now, who has ever here uh, used content security policy? Okay. So you know the syntax, right, the directive, and then you have the keywords, which are in single quotes, and you have hosts, which are or URLs, which are not in single quotes. Enter permissions policy. Now, permissions policy used to be called feature policy and had a syntax that was very much like CSP. Then they renamed it and figured, you know, people can just get used to different ways of writing the same thing, right? So let's go with actually having a different syntax. So permissions policy looks as follows. So we still have a directive, but then we don't have this none keyword or something, but here this means an empty set. And the idea of permissions policy is that it allows the website operator to control which features in the browser are allowed to be used, right? Geolocation, the camera, Bluetooth. And typically the idea here is that you have a first party website that deploys this header and then will disallow using geolocation in particular to frames that come from a different site, right? Such that you don't get tracked and so on. Now, so this means geolocation empty set, so nobody should be allowed to use geolocation, not even the first party, right? Now, um, we actually send a second uh, geolocation header, which unfortunately has this typo here. Well, not a typo, everything is wrong about this, right? But this definitely violates the specification. Now, again, since this is a quiz round, right? Um, so what do you think would happen? Um, we, we saw before, right, sometimes the last header being chosen, sometimes the first header being chosen, sometimes neither is chosen. So my question is, will anybody be allowed to access the geolocation from what you see here? Any thoughts? Yeah? Yes. Yes? Uh -huh, so the geolocation thing would be invalid entirely. So there are actually two stages to this problem, right? The first one is, what are the precedence rules? And in fact, the precedence rules say the final declaration of the permissions policy is the one that, that governs this, right? Now, the, the problem here is that the first one is, is valid and says, nope, nobody is allowed to execute this uh, or to access the geolocation API. The second one is invalid. So m from a security point of view, it would make a lot of sense to say, I cannot parse the second one, so maybe timeout. It turns out, actually, both of them are invalid, and it just defaults to allowing everything, okay? Not what you would necessarily expect. What about this one? What would you say should, should work? So the second one essentially means from origin.com or my own origin should work for origin.com? No? Okay, it actually will, because here the precedence rules, again, last declaration, right? So we ignore the first one. It works in both Firefox and it works in Chrome. Now let's look at this one. Um, here I have star.origin.com, and if I look at the specification uh, of what the, the web website group says, it says that uh, serialized origin is the serialization of an origin, which must not contain a star. So what should be the correct answer? Uh, if I refer to the usage of star within CSP, I would uh, say it's inconsistent between the browsers. Mm -hmm. So, turns out almost. Um, so actually, both browsers, both Firefox and Chrome, ignore this technically is with a syntax error and just say, yeah, wildcards are allowed, even though the standard says, nope, it's not allowed. Now, what about this one here? I'm omitting the uh, double quotes around origin, and origins must be double quoted. What do you think? Should be allowed or not? Invalid, Invalid okay. Um, you are 50% correct because uh, Chrome says it's invalid, Firefox says it's okay. okay. Just as an example of yet another security header that is not even consistently implemented across browsers or browsers implement the standard parsing even consistently. Okay, so basically, yeah, it's kind of half, half ignored. All right, so until we have site policy, here are some best practices, and I'll come to the end. Don't show me the stop sign. Um, we saw that misconfigurations are common, right? Some due to misunderstandings of, of headers because people don't understand the precedence rules. Uh, some due to CDN and origin server setup. 
what you should be doing if you operate a website is you should definitely scan your websites in depth and, and avoid, as Sebastian was saying, these unnecessary browser switches. You can actually use our security lottery pipeline to conduct these experiments that, that we did as well uh, to kind of, well, potentially find your blind spots. And then be beware of the duplicate header rules, right? So just as a reminder, CSP, composition, both are enforced. HSTS takes the first, permissions policy to some extent takes the last, but also not necessarily if there's a syntax error. Set cookie takes the last, referral policy takes the last, and XFO is just what the fuck, right? Now with this, uh, I'd like to close, and we're happy to discuss this with you.